Boston. What a week for the Granite State debates. From 11 candidates on stage at one time to a pair of Republican showdowns, the electorate has quite a bit to chew on as they get ready to vote in less than 48 hours. Let's get right into a discussion with two of our panelists from this week, Josh Rogers from New Hampshire Public Radio and John DeStaso from WMUR. Thanks for being here. Hi, Guys, Adam, we appreciate it. Let's start with that Democratic gubernatorial debate, Molly Kelly versus Steve Marchand. Uh, John DeStaso, were you surprised at all that Steve Marchand wasn't a bit more aggressive in his approach on stage? Uh, yes, actually I was, Adam, because uh, by all accounts, um, Molly Kelly with her establishment support uh, is kind of viewed as sort of a slight front runner, uh, if not the uh, stronger front runner. And I think there was a way that Steve Marchand, while he's been very specific in his plans, probably could have brought the fight a little bit more to, uh, to, to Molly Kelly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he got his points across, but drawing that distinction, uh, I think he left a little unsaid. Now, Josh, uh, you asked a question to Molly Kelly during this debate about immigration and con uh, the constitutionality of checkpoints. And let's take a look at how that unfolded during the debate right now. Publicly involved, uh, excuse me, publicly honored Donald Trump as a... Uh, Ms. Kelly, you've said, quote, Trump's deportation force shouldn't be welcome here and that you believe that the Border Patrol checkpoint set up on some New Hampshire highways may be unconstitutional. As someone who has a law degree, uh, which part of the Constitution do you think those checkpoints violate? You know, I think um, it is throughout our Constitution um, as well because uh, we are talking about immigration, and we are talking about safety, uh, we are talking about checkpoints uh, in, our, in our state, in, in uh, our country. Now, Josh, did she clarify that answer at all after the debate, and did that lack of specificity hurt her at all, do you think, with primary voters? Well, when she came out and spoke to reporters after, she did say that, in her view, the checkpoints would be violative of the fourth amendment. Um, as far as its effect on voters, you know, I'm not sure. I, I think it, you know, may confirm for people who've been watching this debate and are familiar with Molly Kelly that, you know, thinking on her feet probably isn't her strong suit. But as far as something that would really turn off primary voters, like I would tend to doubt that they would see that as, as, as terribly important. Mm -hmm. It seemed like both candidates were mm -hmm. kind of playing it safe and perhaps not willing to take too many risks there. Now for Democrats, there are a few more pressing issues right now than gun control. Here's what the candidates had to say when pressed on that topic during the debate. Well, a lot of folks that are Second Amendment warriors will talk about how these things may impede their freedoms. I want to know why my girls who are in 8th and 10th grade are not seen as having their freedoms impeded when they have to do drills to uh, get ready in case somebody comes into the school. These are not uh, impediments to protecting the Second Amendment. I am a uh, parent of four children. And when they went to school, I didn't worry whether they would be affected by gun violence. But today, I have seven grandchildren and I worry every day. I will not wait as governor for a tragedy to happen in this state. Now, John, it's conceivable there are going to be a lot of left-leaning voters coming out to vote in this primary who might have gun control as their top issue. Right. Is there any daylight or separation between the candidates on I this? I think there's very little actual daylight. Uh, they both have plans on their websites. Uh, Steve Marchand might be a little bit more able to articulate specifics in a, in a short answer. But in this answer, I thought Molly Kelly gave some real, you know, some passion and referred to her family and it kind of brought that home uh, to a lot of people who are, who are, at, who are at home. They both, they both talked about their children or in her case, their grandchildren. Uh, but uh, it just seemed like she had a little more passion in this particular answer. I mean, certainly the logistics of doing this without Democratic majorities are, uh, you know, opaque to say the least. And, you know, certainly uh, Molly Kelly conveyed, uh, you know, an intensity on the issue. But, you know, as throughout this uh, election, a lot of times she suggests that if she were elected, she will be able to do things without necessarily presenting, you know, a strategy for, for persuading voters. But on, the, but on an issue like gun control, I mean, it would have to be a big Democratic year for, for there to be significant movement if history is any god. And Josh, we know that Steve Marchand likes to compare this race to Bernie Sanders versus Hillary Clinton. Is, is that progressive momentum out there? Is that an accurate comparison right now? Could he do this? Well, I, it remains to be seen if he could do this. A lot of this depends on the turnout and, of course, who turns out to state the obvious. Whether or not Steve Marchand could be said to be really channeling uh, sort of Bernie Sanders kind of uh, movement politics, you know, hard to know. He's, he's impure, given his sort of pedigree, frankly, uh, but he certainly is trying to reach liberals kind of where they live on issue after issue after issue and says that 
you know, while his whole career may not be consistent, that the, in the age of Trump, he's learned that you essentially you have to go big and that liberals need to move the goal post is something they said. And I think that a lot of liberals find that persuasive. All right, let's turn to the first congressional district Republicans now. This race bo basically boils down to a bitter fight between Andy Sanborn and Eddie Edwards. They've both been aggressively going after each other. Mr. Edwards going after Mr. Sanborn's alleged workplace mis uh, improprieties at the State House. Take a listen to their exchange from the debate. You know, the truth of the matter is, yes, in 2013, I did crack a joke, and of, of which I have said, and now in 2018, being tied up for that, shouldn't have, shouldn't have done it. But we have to recognize it's still America, and we have to separate the difference between bad behavior and people actually just having a conversation. The real comparison here is President Bill Clinton and Senator Sanborn. Both worked in government as uh, officials for eight years. Both abused their authority in the State House and in, in the White House. Both cost taxpayers thousands of dollars between investigations and appeasement hearings and being forced to take sexual harassment courses. Now, Bill Clinton, that was a new comparison, wasn't it, John? Yeah, it was a new, and it was a new comparison. Um, uh, perhaps more hitting home as far as Mr. Edwards goes, but I just wanted to point out that the question was not about just that one joke. The question was about uh, sort of a pattern of activity, and I, I quoted uh, a former an aide who said that this was sort of ongoing character. And the question was, how do you explain this, this sort of quote? And he, uh, you know, re went back to his uh, kind of default answer that he's been giving all the way through the, as these stories have come out, that it was a joke, that everyone there, that he was alluding to this, this one specific instance when there really was allegedly much more than that. Well, that occasionally he, he says, essentially, I'm a kind of a bawdy tavern yeah. owner. He said, right. you know, I'm an Irishman who own its, owns a sports bar. Uh, he said at one point, and you know, one thing that's interesting about this is the degree to which the Edwards campaign has really, you know, gone aggressively at the notion that we can provoke a gag reflex among GOP voters in the first district. And you know, history would show that that uh, you know this is a different sort of matter. But you look at Frank Ginta's career in the district that you, you know, there is some degree of comfort with uh, electing somebody with clouds over their head. Mm -hmm. Now, we've also had a lot of different lesser-known candidates on the stage this week, uh, creating more of a talking points-free zone, if you will. Let's take a listen to what Michael Callis said on one, one occasion on Thursday night. I believe in some taxes, uh, you know, when you want to discourage the use of something like marijuana, we can tax that. Alcohol, we can tax that. Cigarettes, we can tax Mr. that. Callis. We can even tax Cheetos if Mr. we Callis. need to. So potentially a Cheetos tax on the table. But if you're looking for one of the lesser known candidates who vastly outperformed the expectations that were out there for them, take no look farther than Andy Martin. He was center stage on Thursday night and he positioned himself as a conservative who wants to get things done. But I really believe that there's too much of this promising. The federal government does this, the federal government does that. Uh, I agree that we need less government but I think we need some government. I'm not prepared for us all to run around with loincloths and rely on the Constitution. Some interesting images conjured there, but let's move forward to Election Day now. Are we going to have any surprises, do you think? And we'll start with you, Josh. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I think that, that given what we've seen around the country and uh, given some of the expectations around turnout, uh, you know, I would hesitate to be too firm in any prediction. Um, you know, I think talking to liberals, uh, you know, they certainly believe that Steve Martian has a chance in the governor's race. I think it's hard to know. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to be very exciting in what I say. I don't really know what's going to happen. Secretary of State has said that they, he expects a record midterm election turnout. Uh, I think that benefits uh, Marchand. Uh, that would be conventionalism anyway. But as we've all learned this year so far in other states, is there really such a thing as conventional wisdom? And you do look at the trend in Massachusetts the other night. I mean, it was it sort of almost doubled uh, what was expected. You know, maybe we'll see that here. The the sort of makeup of the demographics of the state are a little different. Um, you know, typically you might think that uh, a, a small turnout would benefit the more you know sort of activist candidate, but. Uh, you know, we'll see. There are obviously efforts afoot to mobilize voters uh, from outside in groups. The first CD, uh, based on the conduct of the campaigns over the over the last couple of days, uh, it appears that Senator Sanborn has sort of the upper hand right now. Uh, Eddie Edwards has had several press conferences where he has continued to hammer home on this character issue. He had one, uh, you know, almost two weeks ago. Then he just had one again on Friday, where this was the same message. Uh, 
with little obviously new trying to with not really yeah. any new and information. It's, and it's just important to, to note that those so CD1 voters, yeah, those so CD1 so. voters in the Republican primary, uh, they've been somewhat acclimated to scandal. Uh, it's a different sure. kind of scandal, but they've had Frank Inta for a long time. They've been used to ignoring some negative headlines. So, Josh Rogers, John DeStaso, great job on the panel this week. We appreciate your time and thanks for your insight.